90% boredom, 10% terror. No, I'm not talking about marriage. That's how we jokingly describe my speciality of anesthesia. Although I have to say, in my case, it has proven almost all terror. You see, I was born a doctor. I have always known it was my calling, but what I didn't know was that my home country of Syria would shatter into a thousand little pieces, tearing millions of lives <laughs> apart, and that I would be using my medical skills as a humanitarian. In 2011, peaceful protests calling for freedom and dignity were met with a bloody crackdown by the Syrian regime that has resulted in the biggest war on civilians and humanitarian crisis of our time. A war that rages to this day seven years on. Now at the time I was living in the UK and as my family were killed and our houses and fields were raised to the ground, I did the only thing I knew and I joined other Syrians in delivering humanitarian aid. Now through this work, I made a discovery. The reason that people survive in crises is because of the remarkable work of the people in crisis themselves. People survive in crises because of the local doctors, nurses, and aid workers who are from the very heart of the affected community. They are the people who dare to work where others can't or won't. People survive because of people like Malak, one of the head nurses at a children's hospital I've helped to set up. She sustained severe burns injury in a car explosion, but the first thing she did when discharged from hospital was to go back caring for small children. From the rubble of death and devastation arise the most gallant and noble human beings. Local humanitarians are the beacons of light in the darkness of war. Now, the data shows that Syrian organizations carry out 75% of the humanitarian work in Syria, yet we receive 0.3% of the Syria aid budget. And what's more, the same is happening across the crises of the world. I'd like to show you what this looks like in reality and the lives lost because of it. This video I'm about to show you is from a BBC Panorama documentary that we filmed back in August 2013. The BBC crew were following me in North Syria on one of my medical missions with the Syrian-led organization Hand in Hand for Syria. On one of the days, we witnessed a war crime. A warplane had bombed a school and we had an influx of dozens of severely burnt children that came to our hospital. Now I do warn you, it is a hard watch but I hope you will forgive me because of the important point that I need to make. The doctors returned to the Aleppo hospital where their journey into Syria started. No one could have imagined how this day would end or the terrible events that would unfold. Oh, oh, careful with the face. Don't hold the face so hard. He's burnt. You irrigate. Hold this. Just hold. A seven-month-old baby boy has been brought in with severe burns. No one's quite sure what's happened. Have you got a cannula, small cannula for a baby? This is too big. The baby cannula, this is too big. Oh, 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 oh. OK, this baby needs to be picked up. Are you the dad? Are you the father? OK, you sit down, you hold the baby. This is crazy. Um, half the kit that we need, I, I'm not getting or I don't have access to. Everything's adult size and not pediatric size. Oh, oh, OK, here we have someone else. OK, oh. Some kind of airstrike seems to have taken place. Most of the casualties are teenagers. They're saying a bomb has landed in their school playground. There's dozens of people that have just been rushed in, covered in burns and some white powder dust. Their clothes are hanging off them. It's only five days since the chemical attack in Damascus, and everyone's terrified that there's just been another one. It's just absolute chaos and carnage here. 
Um, we've had a massive influx of what looked like serious burns. It seems like it must be some sort of chemical weapon. I'm not really sure. We don't know what we're dealing with. Roller orders all casualties and anyone who's touched the victims to be doused in water. Casualties just keep on coming in. The truth is they can't even barely begin to cope inside here. There are a few beds, which is why people laid out on the floor. One thing that the camera will not tell you is the smell that's in the air. It's a sickening smell of burning flesh. It's an absolutely horrific scene. Hospital staff are now handing these out because, of course, the fear is they don't know what's happened and they think it may be a chemical attack. That day is etched on my heart and on my mind and my soul. That is what our collective failure on Syria looks like. But the most devastating thing for me is that I had trained all my life for a day like that. That day, I had the knowledge and the skill and the ability to administer potentially life-saving treatment to those children. I should have been able to give them oxygen, sedation, painkillers, I should have been able to put a breathing tube down and send them on a ventilator in a medically escorted ambulance to Turkey where they would get specialist care. And instead, I had to send them in pain, suffocating in the back of their parents' cars. And 10 kids died that day because I, who could have saved their lives, didn't have my necessary tools and equipment and medication. My story is that of thousands of local aid workers and I have vowed to change that. Now, hope and optimism are not two words that are often used when talking about Syria, but I hope to convince each of you today that you can make a positive contribution to what is happening, not just in Syria, but to other humanitarian crises. But first, we have to decide to not shrink and hide from the pain of war. We have to decide that we will use it to awaken our shared humanity and to expand our compassion and understanding. Let us put together a collective vision of what a more peaceful and humanitarian world would look like. And let us do that by zooming in at the nuances and the details. And then let's look back and look at the whole and ask ourselves some questions. What is the purpose of a humanitarian response? How does it Func function currently, and how might we better deliver it so that millions of people are not suffering and dying needlessly? Specifically, how does a response vary in a war zone compared to a natural disaster? So let's start with that one first. In war, the humanitarian crisis is secondary to the violence. And as such, the first response and the first solution is to stop the bloodshed. Unfortunately, the humanitarian response is often used as the main strategy, which puts an enormous burden on the humanitarians and the humanitarian system. Secondly, the injuries caused by war are of an entirely different and more sinister nature. They cause deep and profound festering physical, psychological, spiritual, and societal wounds because they are caused by a grave injustice. They are inflicted by a fellow human being who has decided your life is not worth living. War is not a one-off event. War is a thousand earthquakes every single day. And as if your world hasn't shattered enough, you're then ostracized and abandoned by the rest of the world. Now, unfortunately and wrongly, many of the people caught in the horrors of, war, of the war see you through the lens of the actions or inactions of your governments. This is usually particularly bad news for Americans, of course. Now, at this end, what happens is these crises explode onto our screens and into our lives, and we're often compelled to make a difference and to help, but feel powerless to do that. I think for some there is also an, a complex interplay of fear, prejudice, confusion, and blame. They brought it on themselves. I think this results in often treating locals with a suspicion 
questioning their motives or their ethics and treating them as trust untrustworthy until proven otherwise. And that is really severely hampering humanitarian response in war zones particularly. So now let's zoom out and look at the humanitarian system. It is dominated by a handful of the large aid agencies and international charities that we all know of. They do good work and are filled with brilliant people who are working really hard within its constraints. We heard from one today. But the issue is they receive 99% of the funding and this leads to different problems. Now the first thing that we have, and especially in wars, is that often because of the high risk and the poor security, a lot of these agencies are not there on the ground either because of that or because they haven't been given access by the government of that country, which is frequently a belligerent in the war. That leaves the locals in the eye of the storm and the big aid agencies often responding to the refugee crisis, and rightly so, but with much less emphasis on dealing with the source of the problem. And so what happens is, in Syria, for example, we have the access. We speak the language, we know the culture, we're able to either ignore permissions, not ask for them at all, or we're able to negotiate with some of the local armed actors better, we speak the same language. But what we have right now is access, but no funding. And so right now in North Syria, in Idlib, there are over 1.3 million people who are displaced and need emergency assistance and we, as Syrian organizations, are sitting there staring at them, unable to deliver any aid. So access is the first thing, and the poor and the lack of access to funding is the second. So one of the ways in which we can access funding is to partner up with one of the aid agencies. Now, in my experience of doing over 10 of those, it takes six to nine months for that process to happen. Six to nine months when it is raining bombs, and you need the money now. When you do get the money, it's often restricted. I would say, we need a trauma unit here, only to be told the donor wants to put a sexual violence clinic. And when we do say, because we know the customs and the traditions and the cultures, this intervention will not work here, and this honestly happened. I'd said this to one of the international colleagues, and he said, well, we've done it in Somalia and Sudan, so we will do it in Syria. And there's the third problem. Very much like large corporations, in order to scale work, you're not able to tailor the response according to the nuances of what the local population needs. But there is good news. There is a recognition at the highest levels within the humanitarian sector that it does need to change. The United Nations has set a target that by 2020, 25% of the aid budget should be going to local humanitarians instead of the current 1%. But unfortunately, pro the progress is extremely slow, and that's why I've set up Can Do. It's an invitation to each one of you to transform the humanitarian response and save lives. We are pioneering locally-led humanitarian response. We are enabling local aid workers to provide the critical health services that their communities need. The local partners that we've assessed and vetted create their own interventions, and by linking them to a global community, we allow them to fuel their response. We've devised a simple model. We source trusted and impactful local groups, we support their development through an accelerator program, and we connect them to you via our crowdfunding platform, where a combination of our strategic partners and the power of the crowd fuel their response. We've already reached 23,000 people in just our first year. We've started in Syria, but we aim to be a global organization supporting other aid workers in other war zones. I want to tell you about our first campaign. 18 months ago, after the bombings of five hospitals in Aleppo, one of which was a children's hospital run by one of our Syrian partners, the Independent Doctors Association, IDA. It was the sixth time their hospital had been bombed. IDA had reached out and said they want to build their hospital for the seventh time, but didn't have the funds. And so we launched the People's Convoy campaign. It was a global crowdfunding campaign to help IDA rebuild a whole new children's hospital. And if successful, we, the people, would take the medical equipment all the way from London to Syria, and we did it. 
In just 12 days, thousands of people and 38 organizations came together to achieve a global first. We built the first ever crowdfunded hospital. We took the medical equipment all the way with hundreds of messages of solidarity and support, and the hospital has been open for exactly one year, and they have treated over 16,000 children. But I would say that the real healing came from the demonstration of solidarity that this campaign showed. IDA was so moved and inspired by people's response, they named their hospital Hope. From a renewal of faith in humanity that came from demonstrating, I am with you, you are not alone. And so to answer the questions I asked at the beginning, the purpose of the humanitarian response is so that we can quickly and rapidly alleviate suffering and save lives. It's so that we can heal the wounded and stand with the abandoned. The humanitarian system is currently failing the most vulnerable communities in their darkest hour, and the system needs to change, and change starts with us all. Sharing a new humanitarian vision. One where we are all humanitarians, putting the necessary resources in the hands of those who need them most and are best placed to use them effectively and efficiently. We need to support the very people who are not only saving lives now, but it will be them stitching their wounded communities back together after the crisis is over to help them heal. The future of these countries depends on these local experts, and supporting them is for our collective benefit, because we cannot tackle refugee crises nor avoid Ebola-type crises if we don't allow the locals to rebuild their critical infrastructure. They are the best agents for peace and security. And so to end, I'm going to invite each of you to unleash the humanitarian in you. Let us honor those local humanitarians who have the courage to persist, to dust themselves off from the wreckage and to start again. They risk their lives to save others by matching their courage. Let us honor them with actions, not words, and with the urgency that their life-saving work necessitates. I'm looking for ambassadors and for strategic partners. Today, I'm specifically looking to raise one million pounds so that we can immediately support the work of 10 local humanitarian organizations, run a children's hospital for the next year, and reach over 100,000 people in just this year. But more importantly, make a bold step towards creating the system change that is needed so that we can reach millions of people. I promise those of you who join me on this incredible and somewhat bumpy ride that we will together save so many more lives. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.